Welcome to Our Own Voice, a partnership in mental health awareness in cooperation with NAMI Wichita and KSUN Community Radio. NAMI is a national alliance on mental illness. We are the largest grassroots advocacy network for people with mental illness and their family members, with over 800 national affiliates and 13 Kansas affiliates, with NAMI Wichita being one of those 13. We provide awareness, support, education, and advocacy for people affected by mental illness. Our, our purpose here is to provide a community conversation on Case and Radio that gives insight into what it's like to live with mental illness. Our intention and hope is that our program will change attitudes, assumptions, and stereotypes about people with mental health conditions, and in so doing, we will stop the stigma associated with mental illness. My name is David Larson. I am very pleased and proud to be your host today, and I am a person living with mental illness. I am in recovery from a major depressive disorder. Like everyone, I struggle with the ups and downs of emotions and the challenges of being fully human, but I am doing great. And I know I have many gifts to offer my family, my friends, and my community. Now, before I get too far into the program, I want to introduce David Peterson, our executive producer. Hello, David. Hello, David. And our technical producer, Mike Padilla. Hello, Mike. Actually, it's not me. It's Matthew. Oh, Matthew is now our technical producer. So let me start that again then. Our technical <laughs> producer, which is Matthew. Hello, Hello Matthew. Hello, everybody. And now Mike is now Matthew's helper. <laughs> Hello, Mike. I'm not feeling very good about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I introduced all three of you folks. Well, yes, you did. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us today and our guest, which is Esther. Hello, Esther. Hi. It's good to have you here today. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, Esther, I'm going to start off with uh, the, my typical question, and that is, where were you born? I was born in Beaver, Oklahoma. Beaver, Oklahoma. Yay, Beaver, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. However, that's not where you grew up and no. went to high school. Where no. did you grow up and go to high school? I grew up in Fowler, Kansas. It's a small town southwest of here, um, okay. out by Dodge City. All right. And... Um, uh, where uh, you graduated from Fowler High School, mm -hmm. and what is their mascot? The Gold Bugs. The mm -hmm. Gold Bugs, and we we had to ask about the Gold Bugs. Do you do you want to tell us the whole? Some of us are still laughing about the <laughs> Gold Bugs. <laughs> so, from my understanding, it's uh, from an Edgar Allan Poe poem or writing or whatnot, um, and basically, it's like a little bug that sits on and rolls around in manure. Okay. So, be scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yay, gold bugs. All right. So, now let me ask you, um, do you have any family or friends who have a mental illness? Yes. Okay. I... And how old were you when you first encountered someone with a mental illness? Um, the first time that I guess I remember would be my senior year in high school. Um, my brother, who had... Um, depression that was when he first started um, having some suicidal ideation was he was in fourth grade okay mm -hmm. so he was he's a, your younger brother mm -hmm. okay is he the youngest of the family yes okay and are you is it just the two of you no there's actually there was seven of us kids seven of you kids yeah. wow that is awesome yeah all right so um, your familiar familiar familiarization now, now I'm not sure about that word. <laughs> you are familiar with your brother's uh, suicidal ideations mm -hmm. and his depression, okay? Um, but you have further understanding because you are also a counselor, are you not? Yes, I'm a therapist, and right now uh, I'm a clinical social worker, and I am the director of behavioral health at Health Court Clinic. At Health Court. Mm -hmm. Yay, Health Court. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Health Court there. Okay. And... Um, what do you do with with being the um, the therapist and the licensed clinical uh, social worker? Um, so there right now, um, I see patients that are coming in um, to see their primary care doctor because oftentimes there's a lot of stigma with mental health and folks don't want to go get help at a therapist's office or mental health place. But they will go to their primary care doctor and say, hey, you know what, I'm feeling really 
scared or my stomach hurts a lot or I'm just feeling really sad. And so oftentimes primary care is where they go and get their mental health treatment. And so we're doing um, that integration piece of it so we can touch people there when they're coming in and hopefully get a chance to help them. Okay. Well, um, I need to note that uh, this is our own voice on Case and Community Radio. We are going to take a quick break and we will be right back with Esther. Welcome back to Our Own Voice, a partnership in mental health awareness in cooperation with NAMI Wichita and Quezon Community Radio. NAMI is a national alliance on mental illness. Now, Esther, um, during the break, we were talking about uh, other things to talk about. And one of the questions is, um, when did you encounter NAMI? And what work have you done with, or um, yeah, what, what work have you done with the National Alliance on Mental Illness? Um, I have been a therapist for a little over eight years, so I've always known of them professionally, um, just as a resource with patients and um, things like that. Um, and then recently, I um, was recommended to David here to do um, Ending the Silence. Yes, which we're going to talk more about that um, uh, in, in our next segment or the segment mm -hmm. after, one of the two. Um, but we definitely want to key in on, on your Ending the Silence mm -hmm. help. Um, but uh, let's, let's jump also back to your brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question that was asked during the break is, did you have to defend your brother uh, uh, at school and things like that? You know, I grew up in a, we grew up in a small town, um, so everybody kind of knows everybody, everybody kind of knows what's going on, things like that, um, but I didn't. Um, everybody was very accepting of my brother. My brother was very um, good at kind of putting a mask on mm -hmm. to say, hey, everything's going good, um, I'm doing great, I'm, you know, I'm not struggling right now, um, you know, but then when he struggled, he struggled hard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it, that reminds me of um, of the one medication that um, I actually happen to be on that I, I've seen the commercials for where they have people walking around with, with their sad face and they have a little p paper mask that they have the, the two dots and a smile, you know, for that they hold up to in front uh, of themselves and other people so that people supposedly see them. And that is something that, that as a depressive, I am very aware of, that you, you put on a mask, you make things work, you smile and you're happy and- You literally put on a happy face. Yes, uh -huh, because we sort of, we sort of fall into that mindset of fake it till you make it. And unfortunately, that doesn't always work. But uh, I it's, know it's that, a uh, good power <clears throat> thing to do. Esther has told me that her brother uh, has had some very successful parts of his life and very really? happy. Yeah, he was, he was wonder, you know, he was a great person. And um, going to the mask and stuff, I think one of the things that my brother struggled with was kind of trying to explain it to us, to his family, why he, or to his friends and family, why he felt like he did. And I think that's kind of why he put on a mask was that he himself didn't know why he was sad. He just was sad. Yeah. And so he didn't know how to explain it to people. And I think that's why he put on a mask was it's easier to say I'm okay than it is to say, I don't know. I'm just sad. Yeah. And it's not just sad. It's, it's, I'm sad. I'm confused. I, I am indecisive. I struggle. Right. You're, I, you're, I, un, I you're uncomfortable in your own skin. Yes, right. very true. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, what work did your brother do for um, for work or what, what did your brother do for work or enjoyment? Yeah, I, um, he actually worked in Woodward, Oklahoma, um, and he did. He worked at Fire and Ice, and so it's like an air and heating place. Um, and he loved it there. They loved him. They actually, um, he'd only been there maybe six months, and they had the day that he died. Um, you know, and we went to visit and get his stuff. There was so many flowers there that they had gotten from the people in the community that just had already gotten to know my brother and stuff like that. 
Um, and then also he, well, his biggest passion was rodeo. He yeah. was a rodeo clown. He was a rodeo clown. That is so awesome <laughs> to hear. He was literally a rodeo clown. He yeah. literally put on makeup wow. to say, hey, and here I those am. those barrels out yeah. in the, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. being chased he, by he Brahma bulls it. and all of that. That's he loved just... it. And he, you know, he that's all he wanted to do and um, since even like the fourth grade. I remember in the fourth grade going to his wax museum. Um, I don't know if you guys did that, but wax museums, when the, you, the kids pretend to be somebody, um, and he had picked, I can't even remember who it was, but it was a rodeo clown. So my mom has pictures of him dressed as a rodeo clown in fourth grade. Like, that's all he ever wanted to do. And, of course, the rest of us sensible <laughs> folks were like, you can't really do that for a living. Like, you need to have something else to fall back on, you know. Um, and we you know, discouraged it a lot. Um, but he was like, nope, that's what I want to do. And so he did it. Um, and then, you know, he even went to um, a school in Wisconsin or in Wyoming. Um, and I think that was one of the greatest things that I learned from my brother is that it doesn't really matter what everybody else is saying, but what you're saying to yourself type of thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he went to clown school. Yeah. Wow. That is so cool. <laughs> Follow your dreams. He did. And he did. He did. You know, all yeah. of us were like, That's don't great. go, don't go. And he's like, I'm going. And he did. And he <laughs> loved great. it. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. And um, what, what was your brother's first name? His name was Vincent. Vincent. But. Yeah. We called him Boy. Boy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so that was his nickname. Then. Boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I need to say this is our own voice on Case and Community Radio. We are talking with Esther about mental illness. We're going to take a quick break and be right back after these messages. Our own voice is brought to you by NAMI. If you would like to learn more about the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the programs we offer, or get involved, please visit NAMI.org. Welcome back to Our Own Voice, a partnership of mental health awareness in cooperation with NAMI Wichita and Case and Community Radio. NAMI is a national alliance on mental illness. So, Esther, um, we were talking about a lot of things during the break, and um, uh, just share with me what, what you have processed and where you are now with dealing with your brother's passing and what you're doing with that. Yeah, um, you know, obviously I really struggled um, with a lot of guilt and um, just thoughts of, you know, this is literally what I do for a living. How could I not help my, how did I not catch this? How did I not help my brother? How did I not save him? How can I help other people if I can't even help my brother type of stuff? And for me personally, um, I joined a support group um, local support group, su uh, survivors of suicide loss um, through good grief, and that group helped me tremendously. In fact, here we are almost four years later, and I still talk to those folks that I met in that, and we get together, you know, um, con um, quite a bit. Um, and then after that, I just got involved in the um, suicide prevention community here in town, and that led me into actually, um, I worked as the suicide prevention coordinator at the VA, um, and through that, I was able to give lots of presentations um, to the community and so that folks can learn how to identify the warning signs of suicide, how to um, talk to folks that are having those signs, and then the resources that are available for them, um, which has been amazing because I get to share my brother's story um, and kind of find that silver lining, mm -hmm. um, you know, because that entire experience was the worst experience of my life. Um, and so just being able to say, okay, what, what can I help? What can I do? How can yeah. I prevent another sister from missing her brother? How can I prevent, you know, any other family members from going through this? Okay. So, so what are the warning signs? 
Okay, so um, if someone is joking about suicide or talking about it, um, if they start preparing for, um, so like giving away their things, um, if they start using more drugs and alcohol than normal, um, if they're feeling very, like a burden to other people, if they're feeling kind of hopeless or helpless or feeling like my situation's never going to change, I'm always going to feel like this um, type of thing, and if they start isolating, um, if they start gathering things that could be used um, for suicide, so if they start stockpiling pills or getting weapons or things like that, okay. or just some of the um, warning signs, those aren't all inclusive. Okay, and now you were also talking with us about, um, about language. Mm -hmm. um, share with us what you uh, shared during the break about language and the use of, of language. Right. So, um, you know, one of the things that I struggled with after my brother passed was that every time I kind of heard that word commit, um, it sounds really bad. It has such a negative connotation to it. It was like an, another little dagger to my heart saying, ah, you lost your brother. Um, and so really getting behind um, person-centered language so that they didn't commit suicide, they died by suicide type of thing. They didn't attempt suicide, they attempted to end their life type of thing and it just it sounds different it doesn't place that negative stigma onto that person you know um right after my brother died i read a thing and it talked about how you know i'm not ashamed of how this person died i'm heartbroken that they're not here and i've really taken that to heart like i'm not ashamed of my brother i'm not ashamed that he had depression or that he died by suicide but i am absolutely heartbroken that this is how now i have to share his story yeah you know. Okay, so so um, you were also telling us about the um, the use of colors and and what those colors represent in the um, I believe it's the uh, um, the um, coalition to prevent suicide. Yeah. So the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Thank you. Yes. Um, they put on two walks every year. Um, they have one in the community, and then they have a campus walk at Wichita State. Um, and so survivors, folks that um, have lost people, folks that struggle with mental illness go there to kind of rally together and say, hey, what can we do type of thing? And you raise money for the um, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And um, one of the things that they do is everybody kind of wears different beads, different colored beads. Um, and I don't remember what all of the colors are, but like for me, I wear orange because I lost my brother. My parents wear white because they lost their son. Um, you know, purple is a family member. I think red is a spouse. Um, silver is first responder or military. So everybody kind of wears those colors. And it's just like a vis visual representation of how suicide has impacted your life. You know, and my parents have come up every year since my brother passed to do those walks with us. And they see other, mo other parents with their white beads. And it's like an instant connection because they know that that person has lost a son, a daughter, a child, and that they know the exact same pain that my parents went through. And my mom, um, you know, has given so many random strangers hugs because she's like, I see your white beads. I know you lost a child. I know how devastated you are. Yeah, fair enough. Well, um, uh, this is Our Own Voice on Kaysen Community Radio. We are talking with Esther. We are going to take a quick break, and we will be right back. Welcome back to Our Own Voice, a partnership in mental health awareness in cooperation with NAMI Wichita and Kaysen Community Radio. NAMI is a national alliance on mental illness. Now, David, normally before the break, I, um, I ask you for that wonderful number, and I didn't get a chance to because I was so enthralled with Esther, but go ahead and give us that wonderful number that is our information line uh, for people calling in and contacting us. That's NAMI Wichita, 316-686-1373. And before I go any further and repeat that number, I want to thank David for the intro music, but Esther is thank you. riveting. And yes. um, 
I'm so proud to say that she's going to be on our Ending the Silence program, which will reach out to uh, 13 to 18 year olds about mental health. And uh, anyway, I'm really excited. Uh, we got a, a very good spokesman for us here. But yes. call 316 686 1373 for information about NAMI. If I call that number, are you going to answer, David? Uh, no, that is an answering service, but I will get back with you. You promise? Yes. Okay. He promises. So that's good. <laughs> he does. So, all right. Well, Esther, um, ending the silence. So what can you tell us about that program? I know that it's going into high schools, but what else is it? Um, so I haven't done a whole lot of the training yet. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to give you generic yeah. so far. Um, but it's just, you know, having somebody who's has that, who has that mental health um, diagnosis or whatnot partnered with somebody who can kind of talk about um, the, sim the signs and whatnot so that we can start making mental health something that's normal to talk about so that um, 13 to 18 year olds don't have to feel like they're struggling by themselves. They're the only person that feels like this and that they're abnormal. Um, you know, and for them to be able to say, hey, here are the resources for me to go get help if I need to. Yeah. Uh, and that's a key point is that that age, uh, 13 to 18, can be tough. And a lot of a lot of kids go through that feeling of, well, I'm I'm somehow different than everyone else. And I am uh, not accepted and I'm not liked. And I just, you know, life is horrible. And and, you know, it just it becomes an endless roller coaster down into the depths. And and hopefully they can be lifted up. Right. And like I said, really hoping that um, we can normalize that piece of it. Everybody struggles. Everybody has um, things that they go through. And just being able to say, hey, it's okay for you to talk about it. And it's okay for you not to be okay. And that's where our whole push for ending stigma uh, comes from is that we need to focus on the fact that this is something that everyone is dealing with that um, what, what is the figure, it's one in five or one in four, um, one of those two of people that deal with a mental health condition mm -hmm. uh, in, in, their, in, in a year or in their lifetime or something like that. Yeah. And um, they need to understand that there is hope, there is help, um, reaching out to people is a good thing, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's important. So Absolutely. what, what else can you share with us? Um, any, any other tidbits on, on your work or anything like that? I know there's a question I was going to ask you, <laughs> um, who is your hero or heroine? Um, so I have a few, um, but you know, uh, my parents, um, they had very little and they worked really hard to give my siblings and I, um, a wonderful life. Um, without them, I wouldn't be sitting right here, obviously. Um, but they have done a lot for our entire family. And then, of course, my brother, um, because he tried. He tried every day so hard. Um, and you could tell that in his life. Um, and he really taught me to live life to the fullest. Like, if he wanted to do something, he would find a way to do it. Whatever it was that he had to do, he was going to find a way to do it. Like the clown school. Like the clown school, you know. Yeah. Like, did you hey. ever see him be a clown in the rodeo? I did a few oh, times, fam. yes, of course, of course. Yeah, you know, and um, just that, seeing that. That would stop your heart, wouldn't it? Oh, my goodness. I could not do it. Yeah. I couldn't do it. There's I, no way. You know, to, to anyone who's who's in our listening audience who happens to, to understand the whole concept behind being a rodeo clown, um, you know, blessings be with you because that is a scary, scary project. Right. And, that, and his favorite, kind of his motto, his thing that he lived with, what was on his business cards for being a rodeo clown was John 15, 13, which is, there's no greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And he lived that. Like, he would do anything for anybody. Um, and there's countless stories of people that have come up to me and been like, you know, I was really struggling and your brother helped me because of this, this and that, you know, type of thing. And so for me, knowing that he, as awful as he felt, 
never stopped caring about other people. And I think um, that's the biggest thing that I've learned from him is that, um, you know, you can always do something to help other people regardless and that there is hope. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you for joining us for Our Own Voice on Case and Community Radio. Thank you to Esther for talking uh, with us about mental illness. And join us for our next Our Own Voice program. Thank you.